Hello everyone and welcome to another amazing um, event um, from us, once with Libraries, and today we're here with another amazing debut author. Um, this is uh, Nima Shah. Um, hello Nima. Hi. And uh, Nima used to be the author of a, the book I'm holding upside down. <laughs> She's the author of Colorado Hill, which is an amazing book that I absolutely adored. Um, so, hello, Nima, and lovely seeing you here. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I'm really looking forward to chatting. Excellent. So, what I wanted to ask you first, if you could please let us know what this book is about for those of you people who might not have read it yet. And maybe yeah. you could just uh, read it, a small fragment from it as well. Yeah, sure. So um, the book is set in 1972 during the Ugandan Asian expulsion. So it's based on real life events and it follows one particular family. And I've tried to keep the focus on the family rather than just sort of telling this sort of boring history of what the facts. And um, it's not boring, but the facts are maybe a little bit dry if otherwise. So I try to do it through the prism of the family. And there's sort of the matriarch, Jaya, there's recently married Asha and her husband, Pran, um, who in particular have various secrets that will come out during the book, and Vijay, uh, their bro uh, Asha's brother-in-law. And through that, um, I've been able to sort of show the different aspects of what it was like to have to be, basically, they, you know, the Ugandan Asians, there were 80,000 people that were given 90 days to leave by President Idi Amin. I wanted to look at what that must have been like, what happened when they came to the UK. And it's partly inspired by obviously the real life events, but also partly inspired by my own family background. Um, because my parents were born in Kenya and Tanzania um, and my grandparents went over during World War II to Africa. So I really wanted to portray that because I've not really seen it portrayed before in literature. Yeah, um, there's not really so much sort of portraits of the African Asians, when you think about um, um, Asian culture, Asian people living in UK or abroad, you always think about India. Yes, and absolutely. surrounding areas. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And it's a distinct culture, you know, the food's different, the language, and you know, I know you've read the book, so the language is slightly different. And, um, you, you know, my mom hadn't been to India in her life until she was in her 40s. And, you know, so, the, but yeah, obviously we have that connection through speaking Gujarati and all the other food that we cook, but it's a much more, it's a melting pot, I suppose, and especially then when you come to the UK and you absorb other elements of the British culture as well. So it's a really interesting culture that I wanted to, to portray, basically. Mm. Did you read a sir? Yeah, I'll just read, um, it's a short scene and it's basically the opening scene of the book. <clears throat> They'd be back before curfew. Asha was sure of it. She got out of the car and looked far across the water to where the Nile flowed into Lake Victoria. In the late afternoon light, the mosquitoes glowed gold like embers from a fire. Be quick, won't you? Jaya called from the car window, pulling her sari jundri tighter over her silver hair. And be careful. Hush, Jaya, she's not a child, said Martigand. Besides, we can see her from here. The car swayed like a rowing boat as Asha's father-in-law hoisted himself into the back seat and lay down for a nap. Asha slipped off her two jumper, blades of grass tickling her toes, the dragonflies dancing at her feet. She shook her hair free from her ponytail, aware that Jaya was probably looking on, loose hair for loose women. Jaya had wanted to go straight home, anxious to reach Kampala before the soldiers began their night patrols but Asha had managed to persuade them to stop off on the way. What harm would it do to get a little fresh air after being cooped up in the car to steal a few moments in the place she'd visited so many times as a child with her parents? There were more people here in the old days, of course, the sweet smoky scent of roasting mogul carrying across the breeze, tinny transistor radios buzzing in the distance. Now all Asha could see was a few fishing boats and the crotchety marabou stalks with their black feather cloaks gathered in the shallows. She walked towards the vast water, stretching so far that it looked like an ocean. She'd met Pran for the first time by Lake Victoria, down by Entebbe. She bristled as she thought of him now. She was sure that Pran was keeping something from her. He dodged her questions before she'd left for Ginger that morning. Asha wandered further along. It was too beautiful a day to waste it thinking about him. 
Something was jutting out at the water's edge, a strange mass that seemed to grow from the banks, blackened in parts, ashen in others. Asher stepped closer. This wasn't the root of a plant, but sinewy muscle, twisting tendon. Upstream there were more, hacked bodies bobbing in the billowing lake. A crackle of fear, Asher turned fast, hurrying back towards the others. Slow your pace, she told herself. Don't alarm them. What happened? Why were you hurrying? Jaya got out of the car. Mottogen sat up, full, voice full of sleep. What's going on? It's been a long day, Asher glanced back, trying to sound calm. Shall we go? I thought you wanted to spend some time here. I did, I'm just a little tired. Asher hovered by the back seat. Why wouldn't Mottogen hurry up and put his shoes on? She looked towards the road. No sign of soldiers, thank God. She told herself that the rumours might have been embellished, growing as neighbour, told friend, told colleague. How could she have been so wrong? The broken limbs flashed through her mind as she climbed into the car. Idi Amin didn't care that the, those poor people's bodies were bobbing in the water, out on show for all to see, killing anyone who spoke up against him or threatened his power. He might not stop until the whole river ran red. Wow, and <laughs> I must say, when I started reading this book, and I started reading, okay, the lovely, um, nice day, and someone comes out, <laughs> looking at, um, you know, beautiful view, where I was imagining, like, oh, yes, amazing, I'd love to see something, oh, look, there's a dead body as well, so I think that sets up the whole scene behind this book, amazing, because mm. people, I think, have a very skewed vision of Africa, and I think that's quite visible for the book, especially when in the second part, um, the whole family arrives to London and ask um, questions about the sort of what, the, <laughs> you know, Africa looks like. And they just don't yeah. mention the fact that you call Africa like there's all one continent. The whole place, yeah, yeah. Yeah. So it's like just Africa, obviously. And it's like, yes, so did you have any like, uh, you know, wild animals? I was like, yeah, <laughs> in the shopping centre. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Yeah, exactly. I think it was really important for me to do, I mean, I haven't had that much sort of personal experience of those sorts of things. I have had a couple of like jokes before, you know, when I say that I'm going to Kenya or Tanzania to visit family and people sort of joking about, oh, is it all jungle? You know, like not really understanding what Africa is and East Africa in particular. Um, you know, there are cities like Kampala and that's what I was trying to get across in the book is it's beautiful. So some aspects of that, yes, Africa is a gorgeous country, lovely sunsets and all that stuff. But the whole juxtaposition, I suppose, of, you know, this, this absolutely beautiful, I mean, it's called the Pearl of Africa. Uganda is called the Pearl of Africa for good reason. But then juxtaposed with what was this horrific period of history with President Idi Amin. Um, so, yeah, that was, it was trying to sort of convey what it's really like, not what people think it is. Yeah. And I think people, um, it's 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 an interesting to discover the country um, and its history through the book. Uh, what I especially enjoyed about your book is the fact that, as you said before, it's not much like a really packed with information about the historical period. You just learn about it through what's happening to other people rather mm -hmm. than having the 50 paragraphs about actually what's happening who these yeah. people are and yeah. why the situation looks like this not the other way and i really enjoyed this part of you know the, the learning about that you can mm -hmm. and about the um, history of um mm -hmm. expulsion of the um uh, african asians ugandan asians but it was done beautifully, I must say. I really enjoyed, I really enjoyed reading your book. And I think it's just mm -hmm. enough, enough subtle hints about the history to actually, to add to the whole sort of, you know, flavour of the book. Yeah. But, yeah. but, but the story is the most important part of it. So. Yeah. Thank you. I'm glad that that's hard because it was a real challenge because it's not like writing about World War II. You know, most people have a basic understanding of what World War II is. And so you're trying to convey a scenario that is probably very, un, you know, unknown to most people. Yeah. But equally, like you say, I didn't want it to become really dry. And in earlier drafts, I definitely did go a bit too expositional and you know sort of as you say a couple of paragraphs here and there about like what happened in the government and and through the drafts I realized that that's not interesting and the best way to convey it is through not just through the characters and their experiences but 
what are they saying? What are their views? And they're not all the same. They don't all think the same about Uganda, about what's happening to them, why it's happening to them. And actually, I hope that that therefore has made it a bit more multifaceted. But yes, I think as historical fiction writers, we always have that challenge of trying to, you want to convey what it's really like to be in that period, but you don't want it to be, you know, sort of overshadowing right. the story. Yeah, and dry. What yeah. I found interesting is how difficult, or is it easy to write about a period of time that is still in contemporary people's minds? Oh, because it, obviously there's still people yeah. who um alive yeah went yeah. through it yeah absolutely I suppose again I suppose it's not like it's not like in the it's not right like writing a detailed novel about I don't know the, the heat wave of 1976 in the UK where a lot of people in living memory will be able to remember that very well um with this situation, yes, there are people in living memory who remember it, both in the UK, people who remember seeing it in the news and stuff like that, but from afar, um, people who've, who've subsequently said to me, I, that's all I knew about it was what I saw in the news is people arriving off the plane, but that was it, and I never really knew anything more about it, but also the Ugandan Asians themselves. So it is it is a challenge, of, absolutely, and that's obviously the beauty of writing about the 18th century, no one can really, really say for sure what happened. Um, however, uh, equally, it's been helpful because there's still people that can talk about it and can convey that and um, you can get first hand experiences um, so, about so, it. So was that part of your research as well, talking to people? Yeah. So in terms of Ugandan Asians and what happened in terms of the expulsion, one thing is that there is some, for some people, there's quite a reluctance to talk about it for understandable reasons. It was very harrowing. Um, for a lot of people, obviously, being uprooted, given 90 days, you, you have to leave everything. So from that point of view, there aren't that many books written about it. There's a few though, which I use. Um, but what I found was an amazing resource by um, University of London, so SOAS, and they did a whole series of video interviews with the people that have been expelled recently. And there were lots of hours and hours of different interviews. And the, again, the great thing about that is I wasn't just speaking to one person, I was hearing different experiences and that fed into the book. But in terms of who I did speak to, I have had lots of conversations with my grandma, for example, and some of her experiences are weaved into the book. And the same for my parents, and they did a lot of fact checking for me as well. So references to, um, I don't know, product like Bird's Custard uh, being in a, in a shop in Uganda, would that have happened? Yes, it would. You know, those sorts of things that I could ask them. So it's a mix of sort of third party resources and then things I've asked my family. It's, it's, I don't know, it must be amazing to actually ask your, your family to just to read in it. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Yeah, did you, I mean, any, did you make many mistakes that they sort of point out and say, no, 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 that would never happen? <laughs> yeah, I think I did have a couple of those, like certain products that I've mentioned, certainly. Um, sometimes the language as well, you know, the, there's a difference between when people were speak, speaking a lot of Swahili and then there was a period where, before that when they were speaking uh, English more so in Uganda. But President President Indigami was very much against that. He wanted that he wanted to come back to Swahili and the local languages. So that was quite interesting and making sure I portrayed that in the right way. Um, but yes, it was very helpful being able to have that. My dad doesn't really need, read fiction. He read, he reads a lot of nonfiction, but not fiction. Um, and so it was an honour that he read my book. Like, you know, he doesn't really read, he hasn't read since school. And I also found out certain things about my parents' past, like they learn about Jane Austen. They, they studied Jane Austen, Shakespeare, Dickens at school um, because obviously it was a colonial education and I'd never realised that. I thought I was the first generation to have read all of those things. I had assumed it was much more of an Indian um, education. So even things like that, it's been really interesting through the book, asking them more and learning more. And they wouldn't necessarily volunteer that information. I think they just think it's not that interesting. But to me, it's fascinating. I think the language pie plays such a big role in your book as well. So mm -hmm. when I, I don't know, my, one of my favourite characters, basically, let's admit it, is Jaya. Yeah. She's, I don't know, is, I think it's quite a lot of people have um, really strong connection with her, but she's such a great character. I really admired her 
um, resourcefulness, her will to live and, and just basically perseverance. She went through so much. So yeah. she first moved from India following her husband to Uganda. And then she used yeah. to move back again from, from Uganda to to yeah. UK to 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 London to, to England. And what I find very interesting is how you feel when you do not speak the language of the community they live in. And I thought through her, you, you portray that very well. The first sort of like the completely unknown of what's going on around you when you have no idea about local customs, local language, local things yeah. Yeah, around absolutely. you. Thank you. Yeah. So she's partly based on my my nanny, my grandma, um, who had that. I mean, she was tiny, like Jaya. She's tiny. She's still going, 95 years old. You know, she's a tough woman. Um, and actually she had a much even more challenging upbringing, you know, so she, she lost her mum when she was five years old, um, and she went across, uh, to Kenya on her own with a, a young baby during World War Two. so the lights would be out, you know, on the steamer and, um, you know, you'd get very ill, so all of those things I weaved in, um, she also was taught to read Gujarati by friends at uh, neighbours because she wasn't able to go to school for very long you know those sorts of things are amazing they're extraordinary to me and even just talking about it now I just think wow what a life she'd had and it's it would have been such a shame not to capture elements of that I mean Jaya is her own character she's not entirely my my nan my nanny but um but yeah, so I tried to infuse all of that in. But I think what was interesting about Jaya as a character is, yes, she has to learn. First of all, she has to learn Swahili when she goes to Uganda. And that's when she's in her 20s. And let's face it, when we're younger, it's it's usually a bit easier to be more flexible and learn and adapt. By the time she's going to the UK, she's in her 50s. And and yeah, as you say, you know, not only has she had to up, have her whole life uprooted for a second time, she doesn't she also can't speak the language and and what a barrier that is but how she overcomes it is really interesting I think um and gets by with that without it at first and then she learns and you know that's not giving anything away really but yeah I think I'm glad that you said that about her I do feel she's one of the strongest characters and yet she's not sort of stereotypically what you would think of as strong she's not particularly loud yeah. Um, you know, so I mean, yeah, it's more like an inner strength and sort of outer Absolutely. strength, exactly. Yeah. And I really, yeah. really like that about her as a character, it was brilliant. Mm -hmm. And also, when you're talking about the coming in new country, what I've noticed about your book is just that Palola is a book about communities, mm -hmm. so and how they interact with each other, how they can connect, but also what differs them, yeah. and how what sort of how sort of. Um, they can live next to each other but be completely different Absolutely. and not necessarily on a friendly terms as well so yeah. this came first when I read about a um uh, the family's visit to their friend oh Mrs. Uh, Gosparmi <laughs> she's brilliant <laughs> if I do say so myself she's just got a life of her own <laughs> So that was that was the first part. Um, so I was wondering if you could just talk about a bit, a bit about that to me. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I think it's quite striking in Uganda, but also East Af Africa generally. And I think this is also quite a common thing of anywhere where there has been certainly British colonial rule. Um, the whole idea of divide and conquer was very much one of the things that certainly they did in India, obviously with partition and what led up to partition. Um, and again, when the first wave of Asians went over to uh, Uganda and other countries uh, to help build the railways um, under the British, the British considered them as being more reliant, reliable than the locals and treated them slightly better than the locals. So from that moment on, there was this disparity and then that obviously continued um and also you know the asian community in east africa and i'll be honest still i think most people would agree is still quite insular both in the uk and elsewhere and yeah those things impact i'm, I'm not trying to suggest that all the racism in this book is all 
white people to brown people because that's not that's not the case at all. The Ugandans are prejudiced towards the Asians, but the Asians are also prejudiced towards them in some ways, not all of them. And that was the other thing I wanted to show how great it is. And, and the same when it comes to the UK, there's kindnesses and there's racism. So absolutely, you know, that's one of the things it's like, I've tried not to sort of impose this view that, you know, if we integrate and we learn more about each other's cultures, then we'll be better off, although I, that's what I believe. Um, but I wanted to try and just show it and let the reader make up their own mind about what actually happened and, you know, how do we learn from those things? Because obviously a lot of the themes are playing out again in some way. So, um, but yeah, that, yeah, it was, it was really important to me. But Mrs. Goswami in particular is a complete snob, completely thinks she's above the uh, Ugandans who work for her. Um, and th thinks she's above everyone really though even she thinks she's above jay or her friend and you know um, <laughs> so, and that, that, there are people that that's kind of loosely based on but that's as far as i'll go on that <laughs> <laughs> okay my, my lips are sealed <laughs> we can always edit that in. <laughs> um loosely very loosely <laughs> no yeah. i really like that and what you said about being above and it's a beautiful scene in your book when one of the characters is on top of the hill and just yeah, looking yeah. at the scene above them. So Colonna Hill is a real place, is that yeah. right? Yeah. Yes, it's one of the seven hills. There are main there are seven main hills of Uganda. It's actually there's a lot more hills. Um and the way that the city's bit built is amazing. It's um the hills are obviously surround it, and then in the middle it's almost like a crater where the city is, so it's sort of overlooked by all these hills. Kololo Hill was traditionally quite a wealthy hill. It's where the Europeans, the Brit mainly British, but others lived before the independence. And then when they left, yeah, the, the Asians that could afford it went and lived in those houses and literally looked over a lot of the locals. Um, and I think I found that really fascinating, but I also just love, I was really glad that it was Kololo Hill out of all the, the, the names because Kololo, in terms of how, this is the writer in me and probably the, the, the visual aspect that I love, you know, the word just looks so pretty and it's so sort of almost symmetrical, obviously, and it, and the way it sounds is amazing. So for all of those reasons, I, yeah, I wanted to, to, to call the book that because so much of what happens in the book happens on Kololo Hill, but equally, even when they leave, a lot of it is harking back to things that happen there and you know that their home there so um yeah that's where that came from um and there's also explanation what the kololo kololo means yeah that came a bit later as well so i'd i've decided as a working title to call it kololo hill and then i thought i should probably find out you know what does it mean and it, i came across it in some of my research and there's this whole story it was about that the story goes that in early colonial times um, a tribal chief, I think he was an Acholi tribal chief, had been imprisoned on the hill by the British. And in the local Acholi language, he'd say, and I'm probably going to get the, the way you say it wrong, but Kololo, and it means um, I'm alone, I'm alone. And even that, you know, coming across that when this whole book is about home, belonging, family, you know, the community, as you talked about, um, I just found that really interesting and pertinent for a book that's about all those things and about what, and particularly a, a place in a country like Uganda where these things happened. Um, I thought that, yeah, that all connected quite. It really fits. It really fits so well. And I honestly thought that you've just done it on purpose. So you actually knew about it and then you just made the book. So, <laughs> no, I have the way around. So, uh, that's why I, I don't really believe like in spooky things like fate and magic and all that but that feels like one of those that was, yeah, yeah that sounds amazing yeah yeah um so um as you probably we mentioned somewhere the book is told from the perspective of three different characters and my favorite is Jaya do yes. you have a favorite <laughs> and I is it Jaya as well <laughs> yeah I've talked about this before and I I've said before it's like trying to choose your favorite child or, or at least no one would ever admit to a favorite child right so but however I genuinely believe like I there are aspects of each character that I love um 
But to be honest, my favourite characters are really some of the secondary characters because they steal the, the, sh the scenes and they're so much fun to write. So Mrs. Goswami, who's so overbearing um, and so oblivious to who, who she is and how she comes across. So she's really fun to write and I, I really like her as a character. But also Motogen, who's also quite happy-go-lucky, doesn't quite realise the chaos he causes around him. He's Jay's husband. And I suppose from a writer's point of view, they're the most interesting to write. But but obviously I have a soft spot for Jaya because of my, my connection to my nanny and Asha, who's partly inspired by my mum. So I guess those two in particular are, are I'm very fond of. I, we can't really talk about the spoilers and things like that <laughs> later. But I really want to talk to you about the Semba as well. Oh yeah, yeah. So I think, uh, yeah, and uh, so this, he is a really interesting character. So December is what's known as the house boy, but um, he's, by the time that the book sort of takes place in 1972, he's actually close to Jaya's age in his fifties, um, but it's just the generic term that's used um, in, in, in most of East Africa and other parts of Africa as well uh, for servants uh, who work in the house. Um, and, Although one of the things that I try to show, certainly with Mrs. Goswami, is the Asians tend to keep the workers at very much arm's length. And there are stories of, you know, accusations that they were trying to always speak in Gujarati so that they wouldn't be able to, you know, the, the workers wouldn't know what they were saying about them and stuff like that. And um, but with December, he becomes quite a beloved family member in a sense, partly because of some of the things that connect him to Jaya is, is probably as much as I can say. Um, and that, that's an unusual relationship. Right? It's, it's not really one that I necessarily saw, certainly in the research that I did, but I saw sort of links to that in Kenya and between sort of Kenyan, um, uh, ethnic Kenyan, sorry, and Asians and some of the relationships there. Um, so I portrayed it from that point of view. And yeah, and he's he's part of the persecuted Acholi tribe. The president of Idi Amin persecutes this, this tribe and December is part of that. And he faces quite a harrowing time as well. Um, and it looks at those relationships between the family and December. Um, and, you know, I haven't written, his, written him as a point of view character. That's not my place to do. But I have tried to at least give a sense of what it must be like for ethnic Ugandans, because let's face it, they were the ones who were left behind and had to face seven or eight more years of, of rule by President Idi Amin. And so, yeah, I try to, to show that side of things as well. He was he was definitely an um, interesting character as well, and and um, important part of the storyline as well. But um, what I found really interesting about your book is a Again, I can't really say too much about spoilers. So I'm <laughs> very, you know, a general about it. <laughs> very vague. Um, it was very interesting to see people's um, ideas about how their lives might progress after they reached safety. Yes. Some people obviously got it easy to integrate with mm. the society with uh, different cultures um and uh, find their own place in the communities either in the amongst british people or other asian communities around that yeah, yeah. What, you know some, some people did and that's how we sort of you know we, we, we've got uh, people living obviously to this day in in england yeah. in, in the uk yeah also what was finding interesting is presumably some people wanted to go back um pran as a character was very difficult for me to understand his um his um, asha's husband and he didn't put him as a, one of the main characters which was yeah. very interesting yeah. but from the very beginning he's the person who is the most invested in just persevering which i found mm -hmm. very interesting mm -hmm. and yeah can can we talk about a little bit about more about yeah pran? About, let's talk about pran um <laughs> <laughs> no it's okay we can we can talk i mean certainly what i'll allude to is you know, as I said earlier, like I've tried to portray different relationships to the country. And mm. it's not to say that some of them don't lo love Uganda more than others. It's just that they have different attitudes in terms of dealing with the issue of what's going to happen to them. 
you know, some will, ha- you know, end up sort of accepting much faster what needs to happen. And also being able to look back and consider what part they might have played, or at least their community might have played in some of the things that led to President Idi Amin doing what he did. So, um, so that is more generally, I think we can say that. And therefore, Pran has a very strong connection to Uganda. And he's quite an inflexible character. I think we can say that. Um, I I deliberately didn't make him a point of view character, partly because I wanted readers to have different points of view on him, because I think he can be read in lots of different ways. Some might, some people might admire him for holding on so much. Um, And I also wanted to, yeah, to to look at, they are being asked to leave their home, the only home in in Pran's case that he's ever known. And whilst I was writing the book, a lot of things were playing out. And I suppose all the characters are facets of me and my my relationship to home, i.e. the UK in particular. Um, So when I wrote this, you know, the rise of Trump, Brexit, a lot of these things, which I hadn't really thought about for quite a long time, not since I was at school and I talk a bit about that at the end of the book um, and you know people telling me to go back to my own country but I was born here where's my own country is it India is it Kenya where is it um, all of these things started playing back in my mind as I was writing this and as these things were playing out in, in politically and there was these two elements to, to what was going on in my head and heart one part was this is my home, UK is my home, and you're gonna have to, I'm gonna put up a real fight to leave. That's how I felt. Um, And then the other part of me was kind of like, well, if I really did have to leave, I have to make the most of it and I have to make the best of it. And that's what I suppose is feeding into the characters and the different viewpoints. Yes. Um, And yeah, and I think a lot of people probably feel that way. People that have had to make their homes in somewhere that they aren't, considered 100 percent you know a, a, a citizen let's face it even if you are a citizen um yeah it's that I think yeah that was that was that was very interesting part of the book as well so it, it's and obviously the way that um in the second part of the book when all the characters come to UK it's not obviously all like you know beautiful and rose thing you know <laughs> rose tinted and, and stuff it's 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 racism it's it's completely different culture for them as well so I think that yeah. was that was very well portrayed as well but what I found was so interesting is that how much opportunities said the characters can find if their um circumstances change as well yeah absolutely and and I should say yes it was racist and and you know it was hostile there was the Enoch Powell speech just a few years before and the the rivers of blood speech um it was hostile but but I also tried to portray the kindnesses and I was really surprised by some of them people were taking some of these refugees into their homes strangers and you know that in in today's times would be challenging for a lot of people let alone in the 70s when things are not quite insular because people don't know the world as well um but yeah I think you know ultimately this family was sort of lower a lower lower middle class in Uganda you know everyone has workers it's not that they're wealthy everyone has them but they are you know middle class essentially and as you say you come to the UK but they were given they're only allowed to take out 50 pounds uh, each out of the country which is about a thousand pounds in today's money you know no money from the businesses coming in um or anything else so yeah essentially you know, they're starting at poverty levels and having to start up again and and ultimately I wanted this story to be a story of hope because so many Ugandan Asians did have gone on to make successful lives here um but we can't forget what they did to get there. And I think we were in danger that if these stories hadn't been written, that we would just pass that point in history and everyone forget it. And, you know, we'd, we'd be out of living history. So, yeah, it was it was important to do that. It's, it does not certainly read as a bleak book. It's definitely, um, it's optimistic, I think, in, in yeah. whole, as a whole. Um, the book and I really enjoyed that part of it as well mm-hmm. and it's like a little things that uh, you write in that I, I really thought it was brilliant like even the scene with the, the, scene with the bingo <laughs> they played bingo <laughs> yeah. no idea what's going on I love that 
That's such a culture clash moment. So basically, yeah, so they they obviously, they're housed in army barracks when they first arrived. See, all of these things I have learned through my research I didn't know about before. Um, and they and this is really what happened, you know, the resettlement board would put on activities. So they'd go to the cinema and I, I can't remember if I made up the bingo bit or what, but they just certainly played other types of games, you know, card games and things. And so I thought, oh my gosh, imagine trying to teach people that have never played bingo, bingo. <laughs> and in different then, languages. <laughs> yeah, in different languages. And then also bingo in particular has all these funny phrases, right? So, you know, two fat ladies and all those funny things that people say. And you've got to try and work out what, what on earth's going on, plus translating into all these other languages. So it just felt like, uh, yeah, it's a moment of slight relief for sure. And I'm sure there were moments like that. I think even in the darkest moments, there are moments of light. And that for me is life. And that's what you're trying to portray as an author. And if I don't believe even the bleakest moments are entirely bleak, there's usually a glimmer of light. Um, so I wanted to show that. Yeah, your book certainly comes through as um, as a, something that's hopeful and, yeah, and um, optimistic within, you know, even with the horrible things that, you know, also happen in the book. What mm. I forgot completely to ask you about at the very beginning is how did you actually start writing this book? Because what I've heard is you started writing it on your commute to work. <laughs> yes, that's right. So I started writing of, of any kind after school, uh, not until I was 37. So um, basically I work in marketing in my day job and we get something called me money at work. It's a um, hundred pounds every year that you get where you can use that towards extracurricular courses that you want to do in anything. It's a really nice gesture. I decided to do it in creative writing just partly because I just wanted to do more copywriting in my job. And then I've started doing these stories in the creative writing course. And then I was like, oh my God, I love this. I've forgotten how much I loved it. I'm hooked. And started to think about the book and yeah over time I thought right I'm gonna write a novel so I started writing it but yeah I have all this time on my on my tube commute into work and my train commute so I thought all right well the only way I'm going to get it done is if I break this novel down because I can't think about a hundred thousand words I'm going to give myself 500 words a day write them into my smartphone I chose not to to write them into a tablet because people can read over your shoulder and I really didn't want that with a first draft. So I was tapping into my phone <laughs> every day. I don't know what these people thought I was doing and people must have been like, that is some long email she writes every day. What is she doing? Um, and that's how I wrote most of the first draft. Um, and I don't think I would have got it done otherwise. I'm not sure I could write another book like that. Now I think my concentration is a bit shot, but noise cancelling headphones on and you start writing I, it's the, I can't fathom how I did it myself actually it's, it, now I look back I think how on earth but you know obviously it went through a lot of edits <laughs> interesting how you um because obviously so many people have a different sort of like journeys to a, becoming a writer oh. and so many people um I think obsessed with the starting very young so you get yeah. those like hey um uh, the best um debbie novels before the best authors before 30 and yeah. the most younger talents and yeah. i think quite often people forget that you don't need to be super young um, yeah. and yeah. don't have a career just before you know and, and then write a novel afterwards as yeah, well absolutely I mean, oh my God, if I'd written in my 20s, it would have been so self-absorbed and so dull. I, and what would I have written about? I haven't really experienced much of it. I'm not to say, that's not to say that all, by the way, not all 20 year olds oh, yeah. are like that, but I was. <laughs> and the, and it wouldn't have been an interesting book. Um, and I didn't feel I had anything to, to interesting to say, but also even, even though I did up to English A-level, and I wrote um, in my spare time, like as a kid, you know, as you do. It never occurred to me that I would do this professionally. Um, even as I started writing when I was 37 again, at first I was just writing. And then I thought, I mean, I can't write a novel. I'm not good enough. I certainly didn't think I had something that might be classified as literary fiction. And I, I still really struggle to comprehend that that's how it's described to others. I don't, I can't get my head around that. And 
um, I suppose that is also another reason that it took me so long. I genuinely just didn't think I had it in me. And I think that's true, particularly of a lot of women writers who come to it late. Either they don't feel they have the confidence to do it or obviously other things that are going on in their lives that, that mean that they don't get a chance to write. But I'd hope it's changing because I think women in their 40s, 50s, 60s have so, so many interesting things to talk about that haven't been written about. We've got so much ground to make up. All these men who are published for centuries, you know, we need to address that balance. Now it's time to speak the stories and now it's time to just to say something. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, so yeah. <laughs> when can we see, um, when can we see Nima Shati author? <laughs> Are you are you on the any other events? Do you have anything planned? If yeah. our um readers, our viewers wanted to to see more of you? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. So um I'm gonna be at the Bath Festival, which is gonna be amazing, um, on Sunday the 23rd of May. I am also going to be at Stratford Literary Festival, but I don't have the dates for that. But um it will be late if we yeah. Great, yeah, I think it's April um, sometime. So, All the yeah. will be linked. <laughs> Thank you. And also, this is really thinking ahead, but in November, I, I'm going to be at Ex Exeter uh, Literary Festival. <laughs> um, God knows what the world's going to be like that by then, but presumably it will be in person. So that'll be nice. That might be one of my first in person. Well, I don't know. The Bath one might be in person. I don't know. We'll see, won't we? You, you've got no idea at the moment. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. So yeah, there'll be and there'll be more stuff coming up. And I have a website as well. So if anyone wants to look on there, I always update that. In the link. And <laughs> yeah. Are you on a social media as well? If anyone, yeah, all to... over it. So Twitter, I'm. Um, I don't know if you want me to sort of say, or I can. We can link to them afterwards. But I'm on Twitter. I'll be linking everything. But if you remember, okay. you're very welcome to say that as well. <laughs> okay. So Twitter, I'm at Nima M Shah, M for Mother Shah. Um, on Instagram, I'm Nima Shah Author. I am on Facebook. I have a page, but I'm less sort of active on there, if I'm honest. So. Um, but yeah, and if not, through my website, which is nemashar.com. Fantastic. I shall be checking the website as well. And um... <laughs> yeah, there's um, actually, if, if there are any writers reading, I do have quite a lot of blog posts on on my writing process, how I became published, all of those things which might be of interest to others and stuff about Colette Le Hill itself. Of course. It will be all linked and everyone can have a look at that. We also do, um, we also go down to Link Albic, which you can borrow from the library. It's there, it's available. Yeah. Please go and borrow it and read it. It's amazing. I really enjoyed our chat, Nima. Thank, Thank you so much. I was going to say just one last thing, which was, uh, it means a lot to me because the library was a key part of it. I didn't have many books growing up at home. So we went to the library every week. It means such a lot to me to be able to talk to people who work in libraries and who work with libraries. Um, yeah, it, this is particularly special for me. I wouldn't be a writer today, I don't think, without the library, so. Oh, thank you. <laughs> really thank you. can actually invite authors and talk to you about the amazing things you write. So, yeah. Um, yeah, thank you very much once again. Thank you. And uh, thank you everyone for watching and uh, we should see you next time on the next event. Thanks a lot again. Goodbye.